everybody. My name is Jacob Walsick. This is Sandy Walsh. Uh, we're going to be talking about a introduction to Nova. Um, so hopefully you're all in the correct room. Sandy and I both work for Rackspace, but we have very different roles. Uh, I'm a cloud architect, and I work with our customers that are building private clouds, uh, both pre-sales and then also post-sales to help them with things like application architecture and planning for growth. And I'm just a geek. I write code a whole lot and uh, generally don't talk to the customers a whole lot. So I, I guess we're sort of flexible on how this talk goes. We, we've got more than enough material to talk about. But just as a just quick show of hands, how many people are at the code level or want to get into it from a, a OK? OK, good. Um, so how many people have a pretty good understanding of the architecture of OpenStack, would you say? So, okay, we'll, we'll dive around a little bit and we can yeah. uh, play it by ear. So, throw questions out and stuff. We've got, lot, you know, we've got time. We don't need to go through the slides. But if there's something that just doesn't make sense, just scream out. Okay. So, here's a little bit about what we have planned to talk about. Like what Sandy said, we can jump around here. Uh, we have more than enough material to fill the 40 minutes. But if you have questions, just let us know. So, start out, uh, Sandy's going to talk a little bit about the tenets of open design. Yeah, so. Um, OpenStack always gets lumped in with, you know, it just says open source, but really there are four aspects to it. It's, it's open source, obviously, the Apache license, uh, but it's open design. If you want to participate in OpenStack and you're doing something that's relatively big, you can go through the blueprint process and, uh, and put a proposal out, and that'll give people a, a chance to look at it, you know, the key players to look at it and see what you're trying to do and give you some guidance as to how to architect it. Um, so there is no ivory tower. There's no grand poobah sitting somewhere that says, this is, and yay, verily, shall we build it this way. Uh, everyone gets to, to uh, give their input on it, and, and, and we listen to all the different suggestions. Uh, open development, uh, if you're doing something small and easy, you don't need to go through the blueprint process. You can just branch the code, you know, create a, um, a Git branch, make some revision, make sure you do your tests, and submit it, and you can become a contributor to OpenStack, as simple as that. Uh, and then it's open community, of course. We have, uh, anyone can be a leader. You don't have to work for one of the big companies. You don't, you, you know, you can, if you're a, a domain expert in some aspect of OpenStack, you can participate. And we have, because it is a big project, we've got a lot of different people that head up different portions of it as our tech leads. Uh, they don't get to decree how things are done, but they're sort of the sounding board for all the different pieces that are going on. So if I'm working on a piece on the scheduler, then I know I can talk to the tech lead for it, and they say, oh, you should talk to so-and-so and this other person. So if there's a part you're looking at getting involved with, find out who the tech lead is in that area um, and work with them on it. So the question of what is Nova? Um, Nova is the compute project within OpenStack. OpenStack consists of many different projects. I talk to a lot of customers um, who for which Nova is synonymous with the name OpenStack, but there's also a lot of other pieces. And some of those pieces are bits that Nova relies on. Uh, Nova is designed to be highly scalable, up to you know, thousands and thousands of hypervisors. And it's also designed to be hypervisor agnostic. Um, you know, the, the cloud that we, or the private clouds that we build for customers are based on one hypervisor, while our public cloud is based on another. There are other platforms out there that use you know, para-virtualization instead of full-blown virtualization. Um, the other projects that Nova talks or Nova works with are things that we're going to touch on during the presentation. The kind of the names are Keystone, Glance, Quantum, and Cinder. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what roles they play, um, but primarily we're here to talk about Nova. Nova was one of the projects that was part of the initial release of OpenStack. Um, OpenStack was initially put out there in July of 2010, so we're a little over two years old at this point in time. Nova's been there all along. Some of those other projects, however, weren't released until more recent releases. In the Diablo release, Keystone came about, and now in the Folsom release, uh, Quantum and Cinder have, have kind of joined the party. As for where Nova is going, um, that's part of what we're here to talk about this week. Uh, there's a whole bunch of folks upstairs, sequestered in rooms, shouting at each other, praising each other, probably some crying, probably some screaming. Um, trying to decide where Nova is going to go in the future. Some of the work going on uh, towards, you know, things like provisioning of bare metal servers and starting to build an idea of really federating cloud platforms 
are themes that have carried over through multiple Nova releases. Some of the shorter term work, like you know, getting Nova moved over to use Keystone for authentication, for instance, are things that were, hap things that were completed in a single development cycle. So here is what the Nova architecture has, has largely looked, up, uh, looked like through Diablo and Essex. We have these different components that all work together. And in a few minutes, Sandy is gonna take us through kind of a, a detailed journey of what the communication looks like as it moves through these various components. But some of these components got swapped out in Folsom. Uh, as I mentioned, the Cinder and Quantum projects have, have come about. Um, Cinder is replacing the internal block storage Nova volume service. And Quantum has replaced Nova network uh, to provide a pluggable architecture for doing software-defined networking and a number of other interesting pieces. When we start looking at the, the full stack of OpenStack projects that, are, that combine to make up a Nova cloud, we also bring in Keystone, which is our unified authentication authorization, as well as Glance, which is the image repository where the base images that make up all of your compute instances will come from. Okay. Um, these are some URLs. We'll, we'll make these slides available uh, to people, but if you're getting started, these are some good uh, jumping off points uh, to get you into all the different pieces. Obviously, Launchpad is where the code, um, the project sort of centers around. GitHub, of course, is where the code lives. The doc stuff is kind of interesting. Uh, there's lots of good information in there, but the, the Nova client is the piece that you're gonna be issuing your commands with, so that's one that you wanna get familiar with. And you can include that, because it's Python, you can include that client as a client library in your own Python programs if you want to control uh, OpenStack that way. Um, DevStack, the, the Nova portion of it, and uh, the last one is... Um, the, the, the last one is the, the Rackspace private cloud software. Um, that is Rackspace's opinionated installer. Uh, you can go and download it for free, or you can go to GitHub and pull down the source code for all of it. Um, it is our installer to go out and deploy Nova. It's designed to work on bare metal. Um, it'll work on VMs with a little bit of modification, um, but it's a, it's a great way to get your feet wet with Nova with a collection of software that's designed to all work together and some chef recipes that make it all happen. Um, we can kind of go down two different paths here. Uh, it looks like we are a bit ahead of our, uh, our planned time talk-wise, so we might have time to cover both. Um, Sandy has some material we can cover that will dive down into the Nova source code, how it's architected, as well as what the API calls look like as they, or what a call looks like as it moves through the, uh, the architecture that we highlighted a few minutes ago. And then we also have something that's a bit more Nova consumer oriented, where we talk through API calls themselves and see what the, uh, like what the curl commands would look like to interact with the API. Um, do you guys want to try and cover both? Is there one that the room would definitely prefer to see? Uh, raise your hand so for code structure. Uh, code stuff. All right. Or as user, consumer side of it. So more consumer. All right. We'll cool. talk through the API stuff first then. Okay. All right. So the Nova API, just like everything within uh, OpenStack, it's RESTful. Um, the, the Nova API, the first command we're gonna look at is actually not the Nova API. It's gonna be a, uh, an auth command to uh, go out and authenticate against Keystone and get an authentication token. Um, any API conversation that you have with an OpenStack cloud is generally gonna start with a call to Keystone to authenticate and get a token back. In subsequent calls, you'll then take that token and present it to whatever service you're talking to to identify yourself and to you know, say that you're authorized to use the service um, Nova also has some commands that are pass-through. Um, so you can make a call to the Nova API, for instance, to find out what images are available in your Glance repository. The first piece here is authenticating. Um, you know, this is, a, this is just a curl command. Obviously, you can do this from your, your choice of programming languages. Um, you're gonna do a post, you're gonna provide some credentials, and you're gonna send it to the, uh, whatever, that slash v2.0 slash tokens. Um, this is saying, hey, I want an authentication token back. What you're gonna get back is gonna be a big pile of JSON. It's gonna include your authentication token, and it's also gonna include your service catalog. 
Um, there may be services in your cloud other than Nova, or there may be multiple Nova clouds that make up your cloud. Uh, and you may want to be able to send commands to different clouds based on you know, availability zones for performance, different environments for production versus test and dev. Um, there may be a Swift, uh, Swift environment that's attached to the same cloud as well. Once you've authenticated, now you actually want to figure out what you can do. Um, so these two commands, they look all but identical because they are all but identical. Um, you'll find that you know, there's a very elegant uh, simplicity to the Nova API. When you want something, it has a very common English name and you can go out and find it pretty quickly. The two commands here return a list of flavors that are available, which would be the virtual machine sizes. It's gonna be a combination of the base disk image, the uh, amount of CPUs, and the amount of memory that would be assigned to that virtual machine. The second is gonna return a list of images. These are the, the base images that you would use to boot from. Uh, for, you know, for something like the Rackspace uh, public cloud, it's gonna be a fixed list, and it's gonna say, okay, well, you've got these versions of Ubuntu and CentOS and Red Hat and Windows. For a private cloud, these are gonna be the images that you create yourself. Um, so if you've built your own Nova Cloud on your laptop or on some hardware or wherever, um, you can go out and build whatever kind of base images that you would like to use to run your application. One of the best practices that we recommend around building images is to kind of limit the number of them that you have. Um, there are some great talks this week around using both Chef and Puppet, Puppet Automation. Um, using something along those lines to automate deployment of your applications and limit the number of images will simplify your life. Uh, when you actually are ready to boot a, uh, an instance up, this is the, uh, the full-blown command that you would send in. This command identifies a image reference um, in that list from uh, the, what gets returned here when you call for a list of images. Every image in that list will have a unique identifier. Same for the list of flavors. And then here I'm pointing to a specific API endpoint in our public cloud in Chicago. And just to, just to be clear on that, the, the flavors are your, your combination of, it's your server's information, like how much RAM, how many CPUs, all that information, that's a flavor. So you can bundle all that stuff up beforehand and say I want you know, 512 megs of RAM and so much disk and so much bandwidth or whatever and, and manage all that stuff yourself. Questions? What's that? Uh, yeah, you can control bandwidth and flavor, I think. You cannot. Oh, um, oh. Not, without, uh, not without an appropriate quantum plugin. Okay. Um, if you're just using Nova Network in the traditional sense, the, uh, they're, they're, that's not something that you can control there. Um, it's just the flavor is sharing whatever, every instance in that model is sharing the network connection of the hypervisor. So if you have 100 instances, it's not guaranteed 100. It's, you're all competing for that same pipe. So the, the question is around th this specific URL. Um, with the Rackspace cloud servers, the way that it's set up, that is my tenant ID. Um, and so that's the format that we use in cloud servers. Uh, in a more vanilla setup, that's gonna be a UUID. Um, but yeah, that, that, I'm saying that, okay, I want to, Nova allows me to have a user account that belongs to more than one tenant slash project. So I'm saying I want to boot this instance and have it be a member of this specific project. Um, for cloud servers, that's your account number. No other questions? Oh. There is. Um, when you boot it either through the, uh, the Horizon dashboard, which is the web-based UI um, for OpenStack, or through the, uh, through the API, you can pass in data that is either going to be led to or fed to like cloud init, um, or it might be data that's part of some sort of injection that you have set up to, like on a Windows VM, to set an administrator password the first time a machine boots. There's a couple of different ways you can do it too. So that's, that's the, the most common way, the most important way. 
is being able to assign metadata to your images and things and have that passed down um, like when you boot the image. But also you can pass in hints to the scheduler. So this, we'll, we'll go over that in a little bit. But the scheduler is a part that sort of looks at all the servers that are out there and all, all the hosts and says, where, where, where do I want to place this thing? So you can pass hints into that to say, I'd like a certain geographic region or I'd like to have uh, something with a GPU or I'd like to have something with lots of RAM. And uh, you can also give hints that way. Uh, that's a good question. So, so the question is, could I assign priorities um, for the scheduling to say, if I've got a big queue of uh, instances being provisioned, that I'd like to bump this one up the, up the queue? I don't think that's supported out of the box. Uh, I think what you can do, though, um, the scheduler allows you to hook in. Um, the scheduler works by weighing and then filtering. So uh, actually, it's filtering and then weighing. So it just looks at all the attributes that you're looking for. And it filters out all the hosts that can't support that. And then it weighs the rest of them. And then it sort of picks one that way. Um, actually, that's not going to help you, actually. Because that, that will help you pick the host, but it's not going to change your priority queue. Uh, so no, <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> Yes, so the, the question is, can I specify some affinity rules? Um, the, the, the stock set of filters that come uh, with Nova S of the Essex release allow you to specify both same host or different host affinity. So if I do have two VMs that I want, you know, same application, I want to ensure that they're on separate pieces of hardware, I can pass in a scheduler hint, and it's just going to be a string of host IDs. I'm going to say, I don't want this VM on the same uh, hypervisor as any of these other VMs. Uh, likewise, I can also say I do want this host on the same hypervisor as another uh, particular instance. There's also a thing, a concept known as host aggregates. So you can make collections of hosts that have certain uh, similar attributes. Uh, not, if, not if you use the host aggregates because then you can just specify the aggregate name. The, 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 to use the, the host filter, yes, the scheduler hint, you would eventually have a really long list. And you may actually have more items in that list than you have hypervisors. The, the, the filtering, the scheduler hints for filtering, um, or for whatever uh, affinity, those were available as of Essex. Yeah, so th those are in any, just about any OpenStack cloud you're consuming today, you should be able to use those. Yeah, the scheduler is made so that you can drop in your own filters and weighing functions and all that sort of stuff relatively easily. Any other questions about that? It's a good question. The affinity rules are not. By default, the uh, scheduler in the Rackspace public cloud will always try and put every new instance a customer creates on a different hypervisor. Um, so for most folks, that's the behavior that they're looking for. If you have a use case where you're trying to keep all of your virtual machines on the same hypervisor for whatever reason, um, you can specify that in an API call, but the, uh, the API server will ignore it. I'm going to jump over to. Yeah, sure. All right. So one, once you've got an instance back from, from that curl command, you'll get a, a UUID uh, instance ID. Then that's your unique identifier for your instance. And then from there, you can do all the normal operations, just like you saw with those examples. Um, you know, Reboot a server, um, resize it. Um, migration is generally one that's uh, um, not helpful. So migration is another one. So you resize uh, an image to uh, or, or an instance to a larger, more memory or more disk or whatever. Uh, generally, that'll move to another host as well if it, if it needs to. I'm going to change that. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. We're going to try uh, messing around with this, so stay tuned.
Let's try this. Mine is not behaving here. <laughs> Gotta love that <laughs> sense of fear. Mm. I mean, really. Mm. <laughs> wow. No, I don't think I'm going to do it. Awesome. Okay. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> uh, so when when OpenStack was first started, um, some of the design um, tenants were established on how we should build this thing. Um, scalability and elasticity are the main goals. So obviously we need to. I, in the early days, I think there was a mandate of uh, of a million. I'm not going to mess with it. Um, what the heck? Wow. Build the cloud, can't operate presentation software. <laughs> <laughs> No way. It really is, I tell you. Anyway, I'll, I'll go through this and hopefully we can finagle it while, while we figure it out. Um, so anything that's, that's not ag uh, against those first two things had to be optional. So you'll see that a lot in the OpenStack design. Uh, inside Nova, there's the, the core functionality, which is scheduling the compute nodes, volumes, that sort of stuff. But then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's available in there, and those are just optional components. You can deploy those uh, if you like. Um, we do everything asynchronously. So we try not to block on our calls. So when the API needs to talk to the scheduler, or the scheduler needs to talk to a compute node, it sends a request out and then it just goes away and does some other work and then eventually the call will come back. So you had to design your software that way as well um, because blocking will kill. Uh, horizontally scalable, we want commodity hardware in there. Um, and that's w when we get into cells and, and those discussions. Uh, cell, so what we do is we have a, um, a, a core deployment that we'll put out there, which is our, our scheduler and our compute nodes and whatnot. And then we sort of cookie cutter that out for larger deployments, so we can actually nest them into a hierarchy. So a call will come in from the top and then propagate down to the other trial cells. And each cell will contain a database and a scheduler and a RabbitMQ and, and all that. So we don't need to build the big honkin' database and the big honkin' RabbitQ system. We can just do little cookie cutters of them and then pass messages around. Um, shared nothing, state management is a big thing with anything of this size. So we always try to keep the state close to where the logic is working on it and um, don't repeat yourself. Right? We don't copy the state around. Um, so when you're writing software for it, if you've got any questions about some of these sort of design decisions and how you're implementing stuff, that's when you go out to the IRC channels or you go out and you talk to the tech leads on those different areas and say, how should I tackle this? Um, because you know, very quickly, once you scale up to thousands of servers, then you've got to start thinking about how many socket connections am I, am I opening up to a database if I do this, or how many notifications am I putting on the queue. Um, in terms of running one of these clouds, queue management is the thing that keeps you up at night. The database is, is an important thing, but really when you've got a lot of activity going on and you start to see your queues run up, then you start to panic and you say, well, what do we do about it? So n fortunately, the way that uh, OpenStack is designed is that you just throw more workers at the problem. So you can fire up more and, and have them process data off the queue. 
So that, that's the whole idea behind distributing everything. Uh, eventual consistency is another very important part of it. Um, you may not get the exact right answer about what sort of state your instance is in currently, but give it a couple of seconds and it'll get there eventually. Um, so you have to be a little bit um, tolerant about that. And, and as a developer, you had to test everything. If you're submitting code, there has to be unit tests for it. There are uh, integration tests that you can do on top of it to really give yourself uh, some peace of mind and be able to sleep at night, but at least unit tests on everything. So that, that's, uh, that was, like I say, one of the very first um, uh, documents that were written around architecture of, of OpenStack, and it's, it all still holds very true today. Right, so, so the question is, are, are there certain parts of OpenStack that don't do shared nothing, and, and there are. Um, so when we get into cells, the idea behind having a cell is that everything is its own little island. Uh, but there are pieces like Keystone, uh, which is our authentication layer that we need to share across cells. Um, but they can be different databases, but we wanna have user profiles and tenancy and stuff like that in there, and that's something that we'd like to solve we just don't have a solution for it yet, but it is. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I'm gonna fight with this one more time. Um, so, um, so let's walk through a flow here. What's what's happening when? So just like we saw here, when we do one of these curl commands, what's happening? Um, so when we do a curl command, we're doing an HTTP command. So we're sending a request into a web server. So we've got uh, you've probably got Apache. You might have uh, Nginx or something as your web server, and that's something that you want to make. <laughs> this is bizarre. Um, so you want to make that uh, highly available. So you're gonna put your load balancers on it, you're gonna have lots of them. And if, if you get a lot of client requests coming through, very simple, right? You can, web server scaling is a very simple thing to do. But those calls come in very rapidly. And, and just, just like uh, we saw, the first thing that you're gonna hit is the auth layer, Keystone. And then from there you're gonna get your service catalog back. And then the service catalog is gonna point you to one of those API servers. Um, so from the client, um, it knows, okay, I get that, and then I go over and talk to here. I don't know to talk to that one directly because that could change. Web servers are gonna come and go and they're gonna disappear, so I have to depend on the service catalog. So um, OpenStack supports two APIs currently. There's the OpenStack API, which is uh, a descendant of the Rackspace API, and then there's the EC2, Amazon EC2 API. So whichever infrastructure you like, you can, you can call uh, each one accordingly. Um, so, that's a, a call just came in. And we don't wanna do the work in the web server because the web server is something that we just wanna do it and get out of there. Um, but then we've got all these services on the back end that actually had to do the work. So we've got the compute nodes that talk to the hypervisors. Um, depending on the hypervisor you're using, we'll generally run the compute software right on, right on the, the hypervisor in a, a little dummy instance. Uh, and then you've got the, the volume managers and the network managers and stuff as other services out there. And there's a bunch of other stuff that you can put in there. Um, but somehow they've got to talk. We've got to get that call that just came in and we've got to get it out to that service. So that's where we get into, uh, oh, and of course there's part of the pluggable architecture of it, everything is, is optional. Um, these are all uh, plug-in based. So I can change the drivers for any of these services if I'm using a different hypervisor, or if I'm using a different uh, networking solution or whatever. So, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is what's, what's paste? So paste, paste is a, a pain. Uh, it's, it's really powerful, but it's, it, is, it is daunting to look at. So paste, um, in Python, when you create a web server, there's a thing called the WSGI stack, which is the web server gateway interface. 
and what it allows you to do is um, intercept the call as it's coming in and put code in at every stage along the way. So it's um, so you want middleware in there that's going to check an auth token or it's going to deal with an error that happens, and and all that can be done in the pipeline coming into it. Um, Normally, that's something that you would code by hand, but everyone has got different deployments. So paste is a config tool that lets you define that stack in a config file. So if you want to have Keystone as your auth or you want to have another uh, check in there, uh, you can put that all right in your Whiskey pipeline and intercept a lot of the calls coming in. So it's very powerful that way, but it is a bit of a thing to configure. Um, there's not a whole lot of other parts of it that actually use an HTTP interface. Quantum uses an HTTP interface, and I think they might, someone could correct me on this, I think they're uh, paste-based. But that's the thing. Right, and some of, but some of them use, uh, so Celiometer uses Flask, uh, and there's different ones. Um, no, no. Um, so that, that call comes in. Any other questions about that? Um, so the call comes in, we, get, we have to make them talk. So that's when Rabbit comes in here. And so Rabbit, uh, people familiar with AMQP, Rabbit queuing systems? Okay, uh, for those who aren't, uh, queuing systems are like radio stations. So all the services out there are listening to these radio stations and they tune in to what they're interested in and there's topics that they're interested in, they tune into it. And when messages come in, they just go, oh look, that's one that I want. And one of them can grab it and do work on it. So it doesn't go out to all of them. They don't all listen to it. That message goes out to that service. And if that service can process it, it says, I got it, you carry on. But if it can't, if it fails, if it crashes, then that message is not acknowledged and the Rabbit server will say, okay, I'm gonna try someone else. I know there's another worker out there and it's gonna take care of it for me. So that's, what, that's how we horizontally scale this thing, is we've got Rabbit in there and all the messages go through and we can just hang more services off of that bus as the calls come through. So now we need to get them connected. So every service has a corresponding API. And when I say an API, don't think of it like a REST interface. It's just a Python file, which is a, a place that you can go and talk to it. So if you look in the code, you'll look at the compute directory where the compute code sits, and there'll be an API file in there. And that's the thing that you talk, so it, you talk to. So if, you're, if I'm in, in the web server, and I want to talk to the volume node, I import volume.api, and I'll make a call on that. And it'll take care of all that magic stuff about getting it onto Rabbit and marshalling up the parameters and sending it in and dealing with all that stuff. Um, so every service, when you look through the directories, look for that API file and you'll see what you can do on those services. Um, and it's a real simple thing. So uh, behind the scenes, uh, when you implement it, that's where the drivers come in. The drivers can deal with that differently. But at the API level, when someone wants to consume those resources, it all looks the same. So the API side imports uh, that API file for all those different services, and that takes care of putting it on the, on the bus. So one of the common questions we get about this is, well, why put Rabbit in there? It's an RPC call. Why do you need all that heavy lifting in there? And what it gives you is it gives you a buffer uh, under heavy load. So it's an RPC call with this incredible buffer behind it. So if things get busy, if the workers get tied up or there's not enough of them, the messages will just build up in the queue. And then eventually the workers will pick away at them. So you can handle those spikes. And if you were architecting this using another binary protocol to try and get stuff on the wire, you'd have to make every service be able to de scale and deal with those calls separately. So you, you get into heav heavy threading operations and a whole bunch of synchronization issues, and it gets a little wonky. With this, even though it seems unwieldy at fr at, up front, it gives you that, it, it's like you know when you see a, a pipe of water going down a hill and they have that, that big uh, tower coming out of it so when they close the gates the water can shoot up into the, into the pipe. That's the same analogy here. You got a lot of calls coming through, you can't deal with them. They block up and then they'll flow through eventually. And it keeps them in, in mostly the same order. Uh, obviously there's, there's some little, little differences in there. Right, so the question is, how do you do a priority queue if, if you want something to jump ahead? And what you can do is you can make as many queues as you want. So if you wanted to, I mean, if, if that was something that was important, there's, there's some places we do that, but generally what you would do is you make another queue and say, okay, if something comes in on that, I'll deal with that first. Um, 
but we try and keep everything relatively balanced. Right. Right. Yeah, that, that would be a neat thing to do. Um, so so now we so we want to create an instance. Is that, is that cool so far? You can just import them all into one file. I mean, you, you wouldn't physically combine them, but you would import them all in one place if you needed to. Um, so, how are we doing on time? Are we cool? We've got 11 minutes. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll fly through this relatively quickly. So, let, let's go through that boot command. Um, so, we wanted to create an instance now. So, the call came in. We know we want to send it off to the compute node. We probably need to set up our network first. We probably need to set up our volume. We need to pick a host. We need to do all that sort of decision making beforehand. That's not something the API should be doing because the API should just be dealing with HTTP. So uh, this is where we bring in the scheduler. So the scheduler sits up there, and the first place for a create instance call is to go up to the scheduler. And one thing that the scheduler does is it listens to all the hosts that are out there, and it says, "Well, how are you? You know, how much memory do you have free? How much disk do you have available? Are you busy right now? Because they could be doing resizes. They could be doing a whole bunch of stuff." And you don't want to overtax them when you're doing that because the hypervisor will complain then. So the, the scheduler keeps track of all that information about how the, um, how the compute nodes are. And then it says, okay, you're the best candidate. And that's where we get into the, the wane and, and filtering function that we just talked about a few minutes ago. And it makes that decision and it sends, it just sticks it back on the queue again the same way as it imports the API. And then it makes it out the compute node and it does the work. Um, the compute node actually uh, goes out to volume, goes out to, um, goes out to network and says, I need this, I need that, and gets all those resources. So when we get into a cell deployment, all that happens is a scheduler, there's a, ske a cell scheduler as well. So when we get into a hierarchy of these deployments, the cell scheduler just says, I can't deal with this, and passes it down to the most appropriate cell, and the exact same dance happens again until it eventually makes its way to a host and the instance gets created. Um, so all throughout this operation, there's uh, any service can write onto a particular queue called a notification queue, and it puts an event out there, and it says, here's what I just did. You know, I changed the state of this instance. It's building or it's rebuilding or whatever. Um, and, uh, or you know, th this operation failed or, or anything. So those uh, notifications will make it onto the queue and then you can have consumers that will pick it up. One of them is a thing called Yagi, uh, and that's not part of core OpenStack. It's something that you, it's, a, it's a, a side project that you can add to it. And what Yagi will do is um, it will take all those notifications and it will put them in a PubSub Hubbub uh, system. Are you familiar with PubSub Hubbub? So PubSub Hubbub um, will take data and then turn it into RSS feeds. So you can have multiple consumers coming off that. So you don't have to have your consumers talking directly to the notifications. Instead, you can get an RSS feed of what's happening in your system. Multiple consumers can come in and listen to that and pick stuff off at different rates, uh, which is pretty cool. Celiometer, uh, Celiometer, uh, I have to say it correct, uh, operates the same way. So Celiometer will consume those notifications and do billing and usage and all that other stuff as well. So you can write those notifications to multiple queues. If you have another service that you have that you need to watch what's happening out there to make important decisions, then you can use the notifications to do that. Um, so it's a handy little hook to have. That's pretty well it. <laughs> That's how you boot an instance. Um, if there's, a, uh, we'll take questions, but I mean, also if you like, we can dive into the code a little bit more. But. It's all pretty well the same. The API is the same. I mean, there might be some slight changes in there, but what happens is there's one plug-in driver for it that now instead goes out and talks to Cinder or goes out and talks to Quantum or whatever. Um, well, it'll go through Rabbit, but um, it can, from there, it will proxy out, or, you know, forward the call out to the other service. Exactly. 
Exactly. Correct. It, it's like a protocol converter. Yep. Yet another hop. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and there's discussions about that. You know, do we want to use a REST interface to it, or is there some other thing we should do to be faster? Uh, because, you know, web servers are nice, but they're, you have to scale them, right? You've got to buy a big, web, a big load balancer, and you've got to do all that stuff. So it gives you flexibility, but there's a trade-off in terms of how you scale it. Um, most just use one. I mean, once so that this is this is the the architectural deployment decision that you have to make is: Do I want to um, cluster my my rabbit and do all that, and make one big hunk and sell, or do I do a rabbit per cell and just forward down to the next cell, right? Um, it, it's actually not really a function of rabbit. Uh, the limitation on a cell usually comes out from the switch. Uh, how many MAC addresses can you store in the switch? And, and it's usually a network limitation. Um, so you can partition it up however you like. Um, you know, a, a couple of hundred hosts, maybe two or three hundred hosts per cell is probably a good metric. All of the tools that you might use to interact with a Nova Cloud are all going to be talking to the Nova API. So if you use the Python Nova client, if you use curl, if you use Horizon, they're all simply talking to the Nova API. Uh, the, the database is authoritative. So any of those things will come through and they'll talk to the database, and that's where it gets its Um, that's right. So the state is managed in the compute node itself. And if a conflicting command comes in, the compute node will say, no, you can't do that right now. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, just what it is? or So REST is it's just HTTP, but it's just uh, that you would... Uh, it's stateless. That, that's the best way to summarize REST, is that uh, you don't keep cookies or anything around, and every call is a single atomic operation, right? Yeah. I think that's it for our session here. But uh, if you want to talk, I mean, we'll be just outside if you want to ask any more questions or anything. Right. Thanks. Thanks.